Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Rose, and this is the Game Corner Podcast, episode 27, part number two. In part one, I went over the Nintendo Direct the day before Valentine's Day. I recorded my reactions for it while watching the Direct. It was half and half for me, in my opinion. If you want to really know what I thought about it, you know, go ahead and check that video out. It's about 38 minutes long or so. Uh, with that being said, I've been playing a lot of Tetris 99 lately, ever since that uh, Direct came out and they put the game out for free. I even won a game. You can see the results of that on Twitter. Speaking of Twitter, follow me on Facebook, Twitch, Twitter, and YouTube, as well as the fanta fantastic voice actor, Erin Fitzgerald. Check her out as well. Twitch, Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. And Black Soccer, of course, on Facebook. All the links in the description box down below. Now, as you can see, I am playing some more Tetris 99. I have a video here, as you can see. So, I'll be going over the gaming news while giving you guys some gameplay of Tetris 99. A 1 versus 98 Battle Royale Tetris game. Quite possibly the Fortnite killer. Anyways, I have news on Dead or Alive 6. I have news on Soul Calibur 6 DLC. I have news on the ESA going up against the WHO and the Video Game Disorder ruling. And I also have a rumor on Nintendo Switch VR. Is it coming? Is it coming soon? Who knows? With that being said, folks, let's get right into it. So some of this news is coming from Silicon or some from VG uh, VG247. Jesus, I can't talk today. All right, so we're gonna talk. Um, we're gonna talk first about Catherine. The Catherine Full Body Edition will be released on September 3rd, and uh, there is a collector's edition. By the looks of it. And does that say a metal box? Yes, it does. It all, it all comes wrapped in a metal case. Interesting. Catherine Full Body has a release date for North America and Europe. The game will appear on the PlayStation 4 in both regions on September 3rd, 2019. In addition, a launch edition and Heart's Desire Platinum Edition has been revealed on the official website. The launch edition for Catherine Full Body gives people a physical copy of the game. And a steelbook case. This case has art featuring the three heroines Catherine with a C, Catherine with a K, and Reen. The Heart's Desire Platinum Edition is more elaborate. It starts with contents of the launch edition, giving people the PS4 game and a metal case for it. People also get a hardcover art book, the game's soundtrack, and a sheep plushie. Catherine Full Body is immediately available. Catherine Full Body is immediately available on the PS4, PlayStation Vita in Japan. It will be coming. Yep, in September. So September third. Now, this game has been facing a bit of uh, controversy lately since uh, uh, Erica is uh, transgendered, which apparently wasn't the case in the original game. But, uh, what is it, some eight, eight years later, something like that, and uh, now apparently they're changing up the Erica character and people are all, are all up in arms about it. Um, her voice actress, uh, Erica's voice actress, funny enough, Erin Fitzgerald, uh, retweeted, you know, stuff going on about it, and, uh, you know, she supports the, you know, she supports it. I support it. I don't have a problem with it. Uh, I don't know why people are so up in arms about a character being transgendered. I really don't see the problem here. But, uh, yeah, you have to check out her Twitter to see what she said, so, uh, go ahead and, and, uh, look that up. I, however, will not be playing this game because the original pissed me off. 
Square Enix has yet to decide on adding Dragon Quest XI's new story content to the PS4 or PC version. Uh, the new content will possibly be Nintendo Switch exclusive. Uh, Dragon Quest XI S is coming to the Nintendo Switch with all kinds of neat extra features and fans have wondered whether the PS4 and PC versions will get the same content. Square Enix says they have yet to decide. During the Nintendo Direct presentation we learned that Dra Dragon Quest XI S will feature new stories with each character being, uh, being their own protagonist among other new content. When asked if there are plans to release the new stories for PS4 version, Square Enix said they are quote-unquote undecided on the matter. When asked about the possibilities of Dragon Quest XI-S going to multi-platform, Square Enix said it will only be on the Switch. Uh, Dragon Quest XI-S Echoes Edition, Echoes of an Elusive Age Definitive Edition will release this fall for the Nintendo Switch. Honestly, if I was Nintendo, I would probably pay them a little more to keep, to ensure they keep that content exclusively on the Switch. To be kind of a bit of a reason to drive some sales towards your console, because if Square Enix decides to put the Switch content on the PS4 version and the PC version, and say those people who have Dragon Quest XI don't have a Switch and they eventually get the new content, then they don't have a reason to buy a Switch if they want that new content bad enough. If I was Nintendo, I would certainly do what I can to make sure that stays Switch exclusive. That's just my opinion. Tetris 99 data, data Miners revealed new modes are possibly on the way. Uh, Tetris 99 players have three additional modes to look forward to in the near future, if a recent data mine is any indication. According to Data Miner Oatmeal Dome, the following three modes are coming to the game. You have Team Battle, Com Battle, and Marathon. Now, we don't know which version of Marathon we're going to get. Hopefully we get all three versions, or at least two of the three. Uh, team battle will be uh, two teams going head to head. Um, that would be kind of uneven. You would have to do 49 versus 49, since um, one team having the 50th car uh, the 50th player would be a little unfair. Either that, or they'd have to add a 50th player to the second team and make it a Instead of Tetris 99, it would then be Tetris 100 <laughs> for team battle. Uh, com battle, computer battle, uh, will let you play against uh, 98 bots. Uh, it will also support the team battle mode. You could also change the CPU difficulty. This is essentially what would be practice mode. Because if you, if you do well... Ooh, excuse me. If we do well against the bots, it's pretty much like training for the real thing. People have been asking for a practice mode, and this is pretty much about as close as they're going to get. Uh, marathon mode. We're either going to get score attack, 200 lines, or endless. Uh, it appears you can also change the starting level and speed of the Tetraminos. So, marathon mode, if you get score attack, uh, you would be given a certain amount of time to, to score as many points as possible. 200 lines would be like a time trial mode where you would uh, play until you clear 200 lines and see how fast you can do it. Uh, endless mode, which is the true marathon mode, you play until you lose. See how long you can last and how good you really are. Personally, I think we should get all three of these modes inside the marathon mode. I don't see why we should only be limited to one or two of these. I would take all three of them. Uh, Oatmeal Dome also said a Tetraminos drop at 20G setting was listed in a line of code found a max rank set, uh, set at 99, which means 
you will need 6.8 million total EXP to reach max level. The game, uh, the game released uh, Wednesday night, the night before uh, Valentine's Day, a few hours after the direct. Nintendo has said there are, are upcoming online events planned for Tetris 99, so that's something to look forward to. It's a free game, people. If you haven't tried it yet, I don't understand why people are shitting on a free game. Just because it's not something totally new. Oh no, Tetris is a fucking classic. The people complaining about this game, I'm sure this this game is older than they are. Tetris 99, in my opinion, is a fantastic game. <clears throat> and I would look forward to all those new game modes. Tekken 7 to add Julia and Negan on February 28th. This is part of the Season 2 pass. <clears throat> Uh, at EVO Japan, Bandai Namco revealed Tekken 7's eight, number 8 and 9 DLC characters, being Julia and Negan. We knew about Negan a while ago, we just didn't know when he was coming out. So Julia is the next legacy character to be added. Uh, they are joining the mix starting February 28th, which is next Thursday. Uh, we have about a week and a half for that. Uh, we also got brand new blah blah blah, gameplay, yeah. So, Tekken 7 is a great game. Did a review on it. Uh, some uh, six, seven months ago or something like that. It's a fantastic fighting game. I haven't been keeping up with the DLC characters, though. I have to get the Season 2 pass eventually. Uh, the last character I got was uh, Noctis. Because he came with the Season 1 pass. Uh, now, I believe Negan is the <clears throat> fourth guest character to join the game. Uh, Akuma came with the game. Then you got Geese Howard. You got my Xbox turning on by itself. That's great. Um, you also got Noctis from Final Fantasy XV. Uh, Geese Howard, I believe, was from the uh, SNK fighting games. Was it Art of Fighting? I don't remember. Um... Or Fatal Fury. I don't remember what, what game he was from. King of Fighters, maybe. I got news on that, by the way. And uh, Negan will be the fourth guest character. So, this game's roster is just growing bigger and bigger. It's what, like a little over 40 characters now? And Tekken 7 is like a year and a half old game. So, you can pick this game up for a pretty decent price these days. You can't go wrong with Tekken 7, and the DLC is just making it even better. For the most part. Here we go. Uh, no, I want to save that one for last, actually. Or second to last, whatever. Dead or Alive 6 to add Mai Shiranui and one other King of Fighters character to the game as crossover. Uh, Koei Tecmo announced at Evil Japan that Mai Shiranui and one more unannounced fighter for the King of Fighters 14 will join Dead or Alive 6 as part of a crossover with the fight with the fighters. Uh, Mai Shiranui actually looks really good. In, uh, her model actually looks really good in this game from what I could see. Uh, Mai is pretty much the face of N uh, SNK fighting games. She's pretty much the Chun. She's pretty much what Chun Li is, the Street Fighter, and pretty much fighting games in general. Because when you think female characters in a fighting game, uh, dating all the way back to the '90s, you're either gonna think Chun Li or Sonya Blade. And uh, Chun Li, I think, was the first woman uh, in fighting games because Street Fighter Two did come before Mortal Kombat. <coughs> Uh, we also got some info on Dead or Alive 6 Season uh, season 1 pass, which includes Mai and the other guest fighter from KOF 14. It also includes con uh, costumes for Nico and Yotengu and Volume 1 and 2 of the Happy Wedding costume. It also comes with Set 1 and Set 2 of new costumes. Now, all of this stuff is in J Japanese, so... Uh, 
the game, it looks like it's coming out this week, this weekend, for Japan, which means we're only like five days behind them. Uh, a deluxe demo was announced. This will be available through February 22nd to the 24th in Japan only, which sucks. It will feature the beginning story of all four training modes. Oh, the beginning story mode. Okay, all four training modes and online modes. You could. I've never heard of a demo letting you play online. This is not a demo. This is what you call an open beta. Uh, the demo features 24 characters and will be available for PlayStation Plus and Xbox Live subscribers. DOA 6 will release on PS4, Xbox One, and PC on March 1st in the United States. Uh, I guess everywhere. Uh, check. You know, so we don't know who the other fighter is. Uh, the costumes look pretty neat. Mai looks really cool. Uh, you know, they got the new the, the two new characters, Nico and uh, Neo Tunga, Neo Tangu. I probably pronounced that name wrong. I'm sure I did. I am very much looking forward to this game. I hope to be able to buy it day one. Although, I don't think I'll be buying the Season Pass, unfortunately, because that's an extra $30 that I won't have. Pokemon Go is getting sued. <laughs> Pokemon Go lawsuit may see Niantic removing Pokestops and gyms from private property. <clears throat> Uh, the devs are being asked to be more proactive when receiving requests to be remo to remove gyms and Pokestops from private property. Since its release, a number of Pokemon Go players have abandoned all social etiquette when it comes to visiting Pokestops and gyms that are located on private property. Residents have reported instances of property damage, trespassing, and loitering, and a number of those affected have filed lawsuits against the developer. Three years later, it hasn't been three years, it's been uh, two and a half. A proposed settlement via Variety is requesting that Niantic resolve complaints from residents in no more than 15 days, removing the in-game points of interest located on or within 40 meters of their property. If the agreed resolution to remove the Pokestops or gyms, Niantic must do so within five days. The company is being asked to maintain a database of the complaints for at least one year after the submission and to refrain from placing any new gyms or Pokestops on or in close proximity to residential properties. Another situation... Another stipulation is that for raids with 10 or more participants, an in-game message reminding players to be courteous to others and respectful of their real-world surroundings is required. <clears throat> Niantic has also had trouble in the past when it came to events and players in public spaces like parks. Uh, the proposed settlement covers this as well, stating that the dev is to maintain a mechanism for parks whereby it provides parks the opportunity to request a specific parks parks hours of operations be applied to POI that are located within that park so pokemon go sounds like it's going to get shaken up quite a bit because without gyms and pokestops and raids this game pretty much dies um now, yes, this has been a thing ever since the game came out. People have been complaining. Uh, you've heard about it on... Especially, you know, within like the first month or two. People complaining <clears throat> about Pokestops and gyms being their houses and whatnot. Uh, people getting hurt. People causing property damage and all this other stupid shit. I don't know why people have to be fucking idiots when they go out to do something. Uh, but, you know, I go to 
lately I've been playing Pokemon Go in a uh, memorial war a war memorial park. <clears throat> so they they have a lot of Pokestops and uh, like four gyms in the area. So on community days I go there now to try to catch my shiny Pokemon, uh, do some raids, fill up on items and whatnot. It's not far from my house. Uh, if, you know, all these parks are going to start putting uh, hours of operation uh, restrictions on the game, it's it's going to suck because, you know, let's be, let's be real here. A lot of people that play this game are all adults, okay? And a lot of the kids that play are too young to be walking around on their own. Or at least they shouldn't be, in my opinion. And they have school during the day. The adults work during the day. So if, if they impose these hours of operations, the game's going to die. Because nobody's really going to ever get to have any fun. So, I don't know. Um, the Niantic, they need to do what they have to do. Uh, because, uh, you know, Pokemon Let's Go now, with Pokemon Let's Go being a thing, if people don't, you know, can't or don't play Pokemon Go anymore because of this lawsuit, and, um, you know, and if parks, you know, parks, you know, they want to get involved, or public businesses want to get involved and request uh, hours of operations for gyms and Pokestops and whatnot, if people are having trouble playing, then, you know, that's going to suck because the only way to get uh, the new Pokemon Meltan and Melmetal is by playing Pokemon Go and syncing it with Let's Go. So, Pokemon Let's Go has certainly helped breathe new life into this game. And it'll be a shame to see it cut down because people have to complain. Albeit they kind of have the right to this time. Uh, alright, let's talk about Amy. Let's talk about Amy. Soul Calibur 6 brings back Amy as the game's next DLC character. Uh, Amy, who has originally debuted as a playable character in Soul Calibur 3, is finally returning as the fourth DLC character in Soul Calibur 6. Four? Who's the third? Tira... Who be and Amy? Who is the fourth? Who is the third? I don't remember. Or is to be the third? I don't know. I have to look into it. While Amy is hampered by her short reach and low damage, she makes up for this with speediness and her exceptional capabilities when in close range. Uh, her costume, can I just say, her look is absolutely gorgeous. She looks really good. Um, doesn't say when the character is coming out so <clears throat> keep an eye out for that now Amy has brought of course a little bit of controversy from the fucking soy boys the crybabies, the snowflakes the pussified SJWs because they gotta go around and they gotta bitch and cry and everything else and always gotta see a problem with everything. Some someone out on Facebook on um, this news post on Facebook came out and said that she's underdressed and that something about an underdressed minor or whatever, and other people are gonna like to jerk off to it. I'm looking at these pictures here, folks, and she's pretty damn clothed to me. In fact, she shows less skin than some of the characters already in the game. I don't see a problem with the character design. People need to stop bitching so fucking much. Um, I'm looking forward to the Amy character. I watched the trailer. Uh, her character looks fun to play. A bit of a... Uh, I wouldn't say exactly a clone... Of Raphael, but you can definitely see some similarities here. Ubisoft 
plans to release three to four AAA games between April 2019 and March of next year. Uh, during Ubisoft's financial call, they, uh, where the company revealed the results for their third quarter of 2019, they also touched on their outlook for the next fiscal year. Uh, fiscal year 2020 starts in April, April 1st, 2019 and ends on March 31st next year. During the year, Ubisoft is planning to launch three or four AAA games. Unfortunately, the publisher did not comment on what those might be. I'm sure one of them is going to be Assassin's Creed. Uh, not even hinting at franchises. So in the absence of solid information, let's speculate a little bit about Ubisoft's previously confirmed uh, no new Assassin's Creed game are coming this year, which takes historical fantasy series off the board. I don't believe that, personally. I think somehow they're going to get something out there. Uh, let's see... Uh, rumors of Watch Dogs 3 is a thing. Skull and Bones, which was a game that was showed at E3 last year. Uh, is supposed to be coming out within that fiscal year. So it sounds like two of the games uh, we have. Um, I honestly am not really an Ubisoft fan, so I don't know much. I don't exactly know much of their work. I have played the crew. That's like really the only thing I like from them. The Rayman games back in the day were alright. Uh, other than that, I really don't like their games. I'm not really an Ubisoft fan. But regardless of whatever they show, I will uh, certainly be interested. Keep my eyes out, that's for sure. Uh, Alright, well... Let's, uh, let's talk about the Nintendo Switch. Nintendo Switch VR rumor could be coming this year. Nintendo World Report sources have told VG247 uh, Nintendo plans to make a VR-related announcement possibly this year. According to the report, a small select number of traditional first-party software titles could receive VR support in the not-so-distant future. Looking over diagrams posted in the report are, and according to rumors, the tech will release as part of the Labo toy line, which makes sense in my opinion. Um, the company said on many occasions that in the past it had looked at VR back in 2017. Uh, then President Tatsumi Kimishima said the tech would be added to the Switch once it figures out how to allow users to play for hours on end without problems. <clears throat> it's quite possible it's quite possible if VR is coming to the Switch, Nintendo will save the announcement for E3 2019. Until then, just hang tight. So is it coming this year? Is it gonna happen at all? It would make sense if it if it is part of the Labo toy line. Uh, given the fact that Labo could be a bit of a virtual reality thing as as it is. Now remember, some of you may remember, most of you probably won't. Um, remember the Virtual Boy back in 1995? Uh, that was for uh, Nintendo's first, um, one of Nintendo's first uh, forays into virtual reality. You know, outside of the Power Glove and the, the, uh, the U-Force or whatever that thing was called for the NES. that All those peripherals they came out with where you could use motion controls and everything. Nintendo back in the day was trying to be very innovative and I give them all the credit in the world for it. I had a Virtual Boy back in the day. Um, it was, if you ask me, it was poorly designed. Uh, it was discontinued before they could even make the link cable for it and release it. That's how bad it was. Uh, it was only all in black and red. And it was like a... It kind of reminds me of... Like when you go to an eye doctor. 
And the doctor says to put your chin on the machine and look into the machine. And then the doctor is on the other side looking into your eyes. The virtual boy reminds me of that because you had to put your chin, uh, you had to put your face into this into this uh, game console and look into it like you're looking into a pair of glasses. But inside the the lenses was a game that you were looking at and you were playing. That didn't have full 360 motion or any of that. You just look dead ahead. Uh, at the 2D graphics or 3D graphics that some some of the games tried to use, but you know a lot of people complained of headaches. The color, you know, the color choices were only uh, black and red because of hardware limitations. Um, didn't last very long. I think there was only maybe 15 total games released for it. Uh, it was made by Gun Gunpei Yukoi. I believe I said his name correctly. And I think he was one of the guys that spearheaded the Game Boy. Uh, if I remember correctly, if history serves me right. So I give Nintendo all the credit in the world. And they were certainly diving into something that certainly was not ready. Now, if they try VR again, I am certainly positive they could be a lot more successful this time around. However, I don't think it's going to come this year. If it does come, we probably won't get it until next year. If I was Nintendo, it would not push the issue. Release it when you're ready to release it. Make it comfortable. Make sure it has a fucking head strap because that was one of the problems that the Virtual Boy had. You know, the Virtual Boy, again, was poorly designed. It was like a game console thing on a pair of thin tabletop legs. Uh, it was easy to knock over, especially when you're playing the games. Um, the power cord was like kind of loose, so if you hit the wire in a certain way, it would shut your game off. Very annoying. You were able to lay down and play with it, but you'd then be laying down with this like freaking uh, five-pound uh, game console sitting on your face. Yeah, it was not very comfortable. Nintendo needs to do the right thing with this. Take their time with it. Release a good product. Because I don't want to see them go the way of the Virtual Boy again. Because that was just horrible. A new medical uh, study shows that violent video games do not make teens more aggressive. No shit. How many fucking studies and research, uh, researches and experiments do people have to do to finally come to this conclusion? But, you know, the news media is just so easy to blame video games because that's all they know how to do. You know, don't blame the parents. No, no, no. The parents aren't at fault. The video games are. Bullshit. A pair of researchers with the University of Oxford and Cardiff University has conducted a study aimed at determining whether playing violent games causes young people to become more aggressive. Um, Andrew... I'm going to butcher this guy's name. I'm so sorry. Andrew Prizibilski? Prizibilski? P-R-Z-Y-B-Y-L-S-K-I. Prizibilski, I believe. I butcher your name, I'm sure. And uh, Netta Weinstein <clears throat> described a study that involved surveying approximately a thousand teens and their parents in Great Britain and what they learned from them. Now, I think a thousand people is not a big enough uh, sample size. There are millions of gamers, millions of gamers around the world. They only sample so they only sampled, you know, a thousand people in the UK. In my opinion, that is that sample size is not nearly big enough. Uh, as video games have become more lifelike and violent, not in every case, <clears throat> people are questioning whether teenagers should uh, teenagers playing such games might become more aggressive. Some studies have been conducted, but thus far. <clears throat> Results to date are inconclusive. Bullshit. 
inconclusive bias. The researchers with this new effort suggest past efforts to study the impact of video games on teens. Excluded a critical factor, the opinions of the parents. To overcome that problem, the researchers surveyed approximately 1,000 14 and 15 year old adolescents and both of both genders and their parents. The teens were asked questions surrounding video gameplay such as how much they played, what kind of games were involved, and the ratings of the games. They were also asked if they thought games made them more aggressive, particularly immediately after playing. The parents were asked similar questions regarding video gameplay by their child and perceived aggressive tendencies. The researchers used mul multiple regression analysis on the survey results as part of the study. They report that roughly two-thirds of the boys and, and half of the girls played video games. <clears throat> they also report that neither the teens nor the parents noticed any increase of aggressive behavior that could be tied to violent video games. Uh, let me stop there for a minute. The survey... Now, I don't know if it's a thousand boys and a thousand girls and their parents. If that's the case, it would be two thousand people. The survey was a thousand people, according to the article. So let's just say 500 boys, 500 girls. All right? Half of the girls played video games. Cut that number down to 250. Two thirds of the 500 boys play video games. So that's uh, 367 people. So now your sample size just went down from 1,000 all the way down to 610 people that play video games. That is a very so that is a very small sample size, and only a little bit more than half of the total sample. Now I really think that this sample was certainly not big enough. Uh, the study also found no change in antisocial behavior. The note that uh, the note that game playing did on occasion result in angry outbursts, which everybody has, sometimes by teens playing alone, and sometimes between two teens playing against one another or by online participants. The researchers chalked it up as normal behavior because it is that arises during competitive play. The researchers concluded their analysis by reporting that they found no evidence linking increased aggression in teens while playing violent video games. Uh, this website reporting this is medicalexpress.com. Now, the only thing this article doesn't tell you are the kinds of games that were mentioned. Violent video games. What is a violent video game? To me, a violent video game is not Street Fighter or Tekken, you know. A violent video game to me could be Mortal Kombat because it goes a little over the top. A violent video game to me is not a shooter like Call of Duty or Battlefield. Those are war games. I don't conceive those as violent in my opinion because you know you're taking the role of a war veteran. Yes, you're shooting other people, <clears throat> but... To me, a video game, what makes a video game violent is all the acts that you can perform outside of the main purpose of the game. Like Mortal Kombat, you can dismember your opponents, you could set them on fire, knock them off of bridges and impale them onto five foot long spikes, uh, cut their heads off, you know, everything else. Grand Theft Auto, I see that as violent because you can do anything in that game. You can kill people for no reason, kill cops, steal cars, blow cars up. Um, you know, I just conceive that as violent. Um, but, uh, you know, most, most games I don't conceive as totally violent. So this article doesn't mention which games are the violent video games that were mentioned here. So, 
I think the researchers should have included some of that information in this article. Um, in their study, which maybe they did in this article. The author of this article just did not include any of that. But, no shit. Video games do not make people violent. Violent video games do not be make people violent. Anybody who has ever committed a criminal act, I have never heard them blame video games. However, I, except for the one time. I think Columbine had to do with video games. Um, it's the news media, nine times out of ten, always blaming the video games. Because they don't want to blame the parents for being shitty parents. They don't want to blame anything else that's on TV that could be just as violent, like movies or TV shows or music. You know? Fuck it. Video games. Not movies, not music, not the parents, not the TV shows. Not what they see other people do in everyday life. Nope, it's always the video games. Fuck you. No, it's not. How many more studies have to be made to come to the same conclusion? Because quite honestly, quite honestly, I find, I find the news media on this to be full of shit. And I will never side with the news media. Unless, of course, the person committing the act blames video games themselves. Then that just means that you need fucking help. Speaking of video games and uh, disorders, the Entertainment Software Association, ESA, pushes back against the... the WHO Gaming Disorder Classification. Now, the WHO stands for the World the World Health Organization. Now, for anyone who hasn't been following this, uh, back in June of 2018, the WHO added gaming disorder into its list of uh, mental health conditions. Recently, Entertainment Software Association, ESA, Acting Director Stanley Pierre Lewis spoke in an interview about how this decision could potentially damage the currently thriving games industry. I really don't see so much as how video games being a disorder could damage the industry. I mean, it could put people off from letting their kids play video games, but that's besides the point. I don't think it's enough to worry about it, in my opinion. The ESA oversees the ESRB and also organizes E3. Uh, in a quote, we're doing things in ways on the creative side that are also very exciting. If you look at the, vis the visuals of new games, the exciting ways games are created, the storyboarding, consumers, players, gamers, and even fans outside coming in are excited about what they see. And more and more, everything we do is becoming gra uh, gamified. Whether it's education or health, everyone wants to use the technology to enhance engagement because we're a leader in audience engagement. End quote. Uh, the concern raised by the WHO is doing particularly given the lack of scientific evidence, I agree, and consensus behind their proposal. Pierre Lewis doesn't deny that some people play games excessively. I am one of them. However, he states that there are now manifestations of symptoms rather than gaming being the root cause from the ESA's perspective. Addiction, in quote, is a medical term that shouldn't be used lightly. I agree. And this is why gaming disorder or video game addiction are terms that have been rejected by medical associations in the United States at the American Medical Association, the AMA. Another quote, I think the market is responding to the fact that they work, they uh, they want compelling engagement by their audience, but they want it to be healthy, they want it to be in a healthy way. So, in my opinion, in my opinion, this is coming from Silicon Valley again, um, it sounds like the WHO is just trying to find reasons to write prescriptions and make money off of drugs. Legal drugs, that is. I do not agree. I never did agree that video game addiction 
is I, I mean video game addiction is a thing but it shouldn't be a medical disorder for example Tetris 99 came out right you're seeing me play it now throughout this video when it first came out I played it for like eight and a half hours straight I played a hundred no I played 82 games in about eight and a half hours without stopping and I didn't think of what time it was. I didn't care what time it was. I wasn't feeling tired or fatigued. I just did it because I play video games a lot. I play video games excessively. I could say I'm addicted to video games, but I don't treat it. As, I don't treat it or feel like it's a medical disorder. And I don't think anybody should. I don't believe in video game disorder being a thing. Addiction, yes, but it's not a mental problem. I, I don't I don't believe that not at all honestly the the World Health Organization you guys just need to give up on this because you you just need to stop all right so this last article here comes from video games VG 24 7 again dead or alive 6 gets uh, promotion censored in Japan by Evo uh, the Japanese, the Japanese division of the biggest tournament fighting games, esports, temporarily closed its stream because of a Dead or Alive 6 promotional segment that was getting too raunchy. No, I don't agree. Uh, a pretty typical part of Evo that is that gaming companies will take over the stage or stream for a while. To demo upcoming products. It wouldn't surprise me if we get an update on the next edition of Street Fighter, which uh, we kind of didn't. I didn't watch Evo. I've seen a few things on Facebook, though. Uh, for instance, uh, DOA Dead or Alive 6 had its turn, uh, but it went south pretty quickly. Uh, it all started with the clip embedded on the video uh, on the website which it was a twitch clip uh, I did watch these clips by the way which depending on how sensitive you are depending on how much of a fucking bitch you are let me reword that uh, may find this NSFW uh, showing DOA 6 is free camera control the MC's deliberately paused yes they did Zoomed in, panned and laughed at freeze frames of in-game moves like pile drivers from the right angle looking like sex acts. First of all, that is not a pile driver. That is called a sit-out powerbomb. Pile drivers look nothing like a powerbomb. Okay. Uh, the presentation continued. With the women presenting the whole thing, spanking each other, which there was no spanking, only little playful poking, and deliberately bouncing up and down while the camera zoomed in on them. The camera really didn't zoom in on them much. Uh, they were deliberately doing this, though. I wouldn't say deliberately. They were having fun. You know, this coming from the land of trash that I call hentai. You people don't have a problem with that bullshit and that garbage. Hentai. But you go all up in arms over this shit. Give me a fucking break. Fuck you. Uh, they were deliberately, you know, they were, uh, like I said, I wouldn't say deliberately. They were being playful. They were having fun. You know, not allowed to have fun. Jumping up and down, they were shaking their boobs. You know, DOA is built on boob physics. Well, I wouldn't say built on boob physics, but... Boob jiggle and boob physics are a staple of the series. Now it says, that clip is definitely NSFW. Again, I see nothing wrong with that. Uh, but of course, you know, the way the world is these days, you gotta say it is. The presenters are obviously in on the whole thing. Um, I wouldn't say they were... Like, again, they weren't deliberately doing this. 
They were deliberately playing up that aspect of DOA 5's crass approach to this sort of thing uh, in the series DNA to point to the point where DOA producers had to come out and reassure fans that a more grounded approach in the latest game would mean that wouldn't mean the death of the DOA breast physics, but it had to be toned down. After Evo decided to suspend the stream until the promotion was over. Quote, and, and this little fucking pussy over here. Joey Q, Joey Kuehler, at Mr. Wiz on Twitter, you fucking little bitch. Pussy, snowflake, probably have no fucking penis. Anyways, he tweets... The DOA ad that aired on our stream does not reflect the core values of EVO or the FGC. We ended the stream temporarily to protect the integrity of our brand. We sincerely apologize to our fans. So EVO has gone feminist. EVO has gone SJW. Fuck EVO and fuck you, Mr. Wiz. Pussies. All of you. I respected EVO. I really did. There is nothing wrong with... You know, outside of a little bit of humor. Apparently you guys don't know how to take a fucking joke. Fucking disgusting. Reactions to the tweet and temporary stream yanking was uh, was as mixed as you'd expect. Some praised Evo for its speed in deciding it didn't want to air this content on their channels. While others criticized it as censorship. It is censorship. Exactly. It is censorship. And the people that praise this are all pussies. Fucking pussies. Uh, I don't I don't know what else to say. I honestly don't. Um, uh, fighting games have frequently run into these sorts of problems over the last few years. Uh, unless you're Mr. Harada. The guy who, you know, is the lead creator of Tekken, you, you know, he tells you to go fuck yourself. I wholeheartedly support Mr. Harada. Um, Street Fighter V wrestled with this issue. Yeah, they had to censor Armiko, which again was bullshit. Uh, this just goes on and on, giving other examples of how fighting games have faced uh, scrutiny over the recent years, but Mortal Kombat 11 doesn't face any kind of issues. Dismemberment, a lot of, you know, some of the female characters showing a lot of skin. I about remember in Mortal Kombat 9, the unlockable um, bandage Melina costume. She was literally naked with one big bandage wrapped around her private parts to cover them up. That was it. Where were all the pussies then? I don't know. I don't know. Where are all the pussies now? I don't see all you people up in arms now over being able to decapitate and dismember your opponents and drink their blood and rip their brains out of their heads and eat them and uh, characters being a, a bit underdressed and the games being over the top. Mortal Kombat never faces that kind of scrutiny. Why? But yet, yeah, Dead or Alive 6... God forbid it has a boob jiggle. God forbid these presenters want to come out and have a little bit of fun. They ha they get censored because of pussies like Evo. Fuck you. That's all I gotta say. Fuck you. Fuck you, Mr. Wiz. Fuck Evo. And again, in the land of the rising sun, where hentai and anime with a lot of nudity purpose purposely added into it is a thing. I don't want to hear that shit. I really don't. That being said, folks, that is the end of episode 27 of the Game Corner podcast. Um, yeah, there was a, quite a bit to go over this time around. I went nearly an hour today, about 55 minutes, so I want to thank you all for watching. Again, uh, check out uh, you know, my latest videos, part one is on the channel. I also did a 
demo of the Yoshi's Crafter World game. The demo also released uh, the night of the Direct. I played through it. Uh, it was pretty fun what I played. I can't wait for the actual game to come out. With that being said, folks, thanks for watching. Thanks for checking out those videos. My name is The Rose, and until next time, I'll catch your ass down the road.